All right. We are going to attempt to get through all of chapter 4 today. We are behind, um, and hopefully we can get into a little of chapter 5. I'm not really crossing my fingers for that one, though. No. All right. Mark chapter 3. We uh, did not quite finish that. We, uh, we left off at the end of chapter 3. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and turn there. And verses 22 through 30, the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Verse 22, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul. And by the prince of demons, he casts out the demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man, then indeed he may plunder the house. Truly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man, but, and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying he has an unclean spirit. Now this section of scripture has been quite difficult to understand what is meant here. And unfortunately, we don't have the opportunity to go up to Jesus and say, what did you mean? And so we need to draw upon our knowledge from other parts of Scripture. We need to draw upon our knowledge from the, the implication he is making from this section of the text to figure out what it is that Jesus is trying to get across. In other words, is there a sin that if we commit once, we are eternally damned? Is that what Jesus is saying? Because he says that if whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. Never has forgiveness. If you blaspheme against the Spirit, you never have forgiveness. He says you are guilty of an eternal sin. So does that mean that if, if when I was 12 years old or 15 years old or 18 or 21 or however old I was, that I blasphemed against the Holy Spirit or in the context of this text, I attributed to Satan that which was God's, because that's exactly what these Pharisees did, that I can never be saved no matter what I do. That having been washed in the waters of baptism, I'm still not saved because this is an eternal sin and I can never ever forget. Is that what this text is saying? I want you guys to think about that for a second. Give me an answer. What do you think? Yes or no? I think I heard a cricket. It's a difficult text to understand, isn't it? From what we know of the rest of Scripture, that cannot be the interpretation. That, that cannot be it. Because in Acts 2, we find out that this promise, the promise of salvation, the promise of forgiveness of sins, is available not only to those in that time period, but to all those who are far off. To everybody. That means that it is open to everybody in the future. We also know that the blood of Christ has been imputed backwards. Hebrews 7 verse 25 talks about that. That forgiveness goes all the way back to the beginning of time. Otherwise, the hall of faith in Hebrews 11 would have absolutely no implication to us if they were not saved. The blood of Jesus is imputed both backwards and forwards and it covers all sins. So what is it that Jesus is trying to get across here? I think there are a few things that we ought to take note of. One, the scribes and Pharisees accuse Jesus of being possessed by demons, of being the prince of demons, of being Satan himself. He is the son of God. He is not a demon. He is not the devil. He is not Satan. He is deity. And to attribute to him that which is completely contrary to his nature is something he needed to respond to. 
There are things that Jesus did not respond to throughout the text. In fact, when you see that uh, they came up to him and called him a drunkard, he didn't really respond to that much, did he? Or he eats with tax collectors and sinners. He responded, but he said, yes, I do, for this reason. But here, they bring a false accusation, accusing him of being Satan, accusing him of being the devil, accusing him of being a demon. And he responds back. And his response is, is quite powerful. In fact, it's powerful enough that uh, not only has it been used throughout history and with, with Jesus himself, but uh, you, you, you all recall Abraham Lincoln using that, right? Abraham Lincoln used it in one of his speeches. A house divided cannot stand. Is a reference to here. Talking about the nation, the United States, a house divided cannot stand. It's a reference to what Jesus said right here. Jesus makes the point that Satan will not cast out Satan. Why would you intentionally limp yourself? Why would you intentionally make yourself weaker? Intentionally cause yourself to stumble, cause yourself to have problems, to divide your own kingdom. Verse 25, a house divided against itself will not be able to stand. Marriages will not last if, if, if you are constantly bickering and, and divided and going against one another. Friendships, work relations within the church, if we are not united in mind, in soul, in spirit, we're not going to last. Because a house divided cannot stand. Then he says in verse 27, No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. What a weird thing to say after all of these other things, huh? Bind a strong man, plunder his house. Who is Jesus talking about in this section? Well, who is the strong man here? Anybody? Satan. And who's doing the plundering? Jesus. Jesus has bound the strong man and is going into Satan's house, the world, and plundering the goods that are there, the people, the souls, bringing them to Christ. It's an interesting, interesting section of scripture. But Jesus is making the point that he is stronger than the strong man. He is not in, in league with, but rather opposed to the strong man, opposed to Satan. And then we get to 28. All sins will be forgiven the children of man and whatever blasphemies they utter. Okay. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. Now we get to the, the real difficult section, huh? All sins will be forgiven the children of man. Do y'all believe that? I see some people falling asleep. I'm so sorry. Yes. Yes, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. Pay attention to the tense of the word blaspheme here. Whoever blasphemes, in other words, it is present tense, continuous action. This is somebody who is continually, consistently, throughout their life, blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. Well, what do we know about all sin? What does all sin do? It separates us from God. And if we're separated from God, we don't have, we don't have hope of heaven. We don't have forgiveness of sins. We don't have any of that. And so someone who is continually sinning, what if that continual sin is gluttony? What's the, what's the result? They are lost. What if it's lying, stealing, cheating? They are lost. 
The point he is making is whoever continues to sin is guilty of an eternal sin because sin is eternal unless it is forgiven. Does that make sense to everybody? Kind of, sort of. It's a difficult passage, difficult section, and, and this is, to the best of my knowledge, the conclusion that I have come up with now. If you have different thoughts on this, if you are concerned about how I have presented this, please come and talk with me. Be happy to discuss it and, and try to explain in more detail uh, why I have said what I have said, but um, I, I do not mean to make light of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit because it is a sin. And in the eyes of God, sin is what we might consider a class A felony. It is the worst thing you can do. The worst of the worst. That is, it's awful. There is no sin that God does not see as awful. And blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is one of those. And these scribes, these Pharisees, were accusing Jesus of being something that he was not. And he had to respond. He had to explain to them, this is not who I am. I cannot be what you are calling me. All right. Any thoughts, questions, comments, concerns there? All right. We're going to uh, go ahead and skip 31 through 35. Uh, very briefly, that is a, um, a section in which Jesus is calling all people all people to follow him. That blood relation is of less consequence than doing the will of the Father and doing the will of God. Not that it is inconsequential, but it is of less consequence. All right, chapter four, verse one. Now we get to the parables. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land and he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately, it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. And it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him here. This parable is one that we, we talk about fairly often, but I think is such a powerful parable. And what exactly is a parable? Somebody explain to me what a parable is. A story with a heavenly meaning. That is the easiest way to explain it to somebody, isn't it? This is a, a story that is meant to have a meaning that is beyond the story itself. Jesus is not just talking about a man who is going out to sow, is he? There's a purpose to it. And there is one main purpose that he is trying to get across. One primary purpose. Right now, we can extract and we can pull out a lot of different things from parables, can't we? But we would be remiss if we don't try to pay attention to the one main point that Jesus is trying to get across. He explains what that is in 10 through 20. So let's read that and we will talk about it as a whole. And when he was alone, Jesus that is, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see, but not 
perceive and may indeed hear but not understand lest they should turn and be forgiven and he said to them do you not understand this parable how then will you understand all the parables the sower sows the word and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown when they hear Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are ones, they are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that are sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. All right. All right. What, what is the seed? Somebody real quick. What's the seed? The word of God. And, and these soils, what do they represent? Different kinds of hearts in men. And women, yes. In people, right? So we have... The word of God that is being sown, that is being scattered, that is being uh, planted in different locations, right? The word of God obviously being the Bible, uh, the word also being Jesus Christ. We are sharing Christ. We are sharing the Lord when we share the word of God. Because John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God, and then John 1.14, the word became flesh. So we are not only sharing uh, uh, the, the text here, we are sharing the answer. We're sharing the cure. We're sharing the only way in which we can be saved when we share the word of God. We have some seed here that is on rocky ground. You know, a couple weeks ago, I mentioned that Alyssa and I went to uh, a small congregation in Ira Ann. And as we drove there, do you know what we saw? Huh? huh? Nothing. That is right. We saw cactuses, and we saw lots of rocks and lots of pebbles. And we saw, we did see some, uh, some goats. We did see goats. There are lots of goats. But lots of rocky ground. You know what we didn't see out there? We didn't see a whole lot of crops. We didn't see any corn. We didn't see any wheat. Didn't see any cotton. Didn't see, we didn't see anything that was related to or relative to any sort of produce or something that could grow. The only plants that we saw out there were cactus. That's it. And I don't think many people mass produce cactuses for the purpose of wholesale. The rocky ground is a heart, is an individual that is unwilling, unable at that moment in time to receive the word of God. Have you all ever been in that place? Has your heart ever been in a place where you are unwilling to receive God's word? Maybe you're even coming to church Sunday mornings and Wednesday nights and, and you're doing everything that you can because you're, you know what you ought to do, you know what you're supposed to do, but in your heart, you're sitting in the pew and you feel nothing. You feel empty. Your heart is hardened. If that's ever been you, you're not alone. You're not alone. That may be you this morning. There's hope for you if that's how your heart is this morning. 
I'll get to that in just a minute. So we have the, excuse me, the path is, is the, 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 whatever it is. The rocky ground is uh, uh, where you've got this, this ability to, to, to have your roots in, but the cares of the world, they, they, they pull it away. They have no root. That, that, that rocky ground is, is there to, to stop the roots from digging any deeper. And so many, initially, this, this individual, this heart, may, may receive the word with gladness, with joy, excited about the, the prospect and possibility of a, a change in life. But then something happens. Something comes up. Somebody passes. Lose a job. Life gets in the way. Children are going to all sorts of sporting events. Some, something occurs in this individual who is excited about God's word, and excited about the gospel, but has no root, has no foundation, withers away because that persecution comes. And then we have these that, that, that fall among thorns, and the thorns grow up and choke it, and it, it doesn't yield any grain. These are people that are also kind of excited about God's word, aren't they? They want to hear more about it, but, but then they start to see that there's other options out there. There's, there's more to be gained than just self-sacrifice. You know, I can do things for myself. I can acquire things for me. I, 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 I. And so the thorns choke it out. Because this individual is so focused on what the world has to offer and what they can gain from the world, that they're missing out on what they can gain from God. And then the last one is good soil. The soil, the heart, the individual where not only do they hear the word of God, but they dedicate themselves to studying it. And then, and here's the key part, they produce more. They produce more. They do something with that which they have gained. They don't just allow themselves to grow and to sprout and then to die and wither away without letting their seed go out. They allow their seed to spread and to grow. You ever wonder why weeds are so effective? Because their seed spreads all the time. And if you don't get every one of those weeds up and all of those seeds, you're gonna, they're gonna come back the next year. The same thing is true for good crops and good plants. They can flourish and they can grow in the right environment, in the right place, surrounded by the right things, and they can continue, continue to give fruit. I would argue, and I might argue this relatively vehemently, but I would argue that everybody at some point in their life has been one of these soil types. That if you were to look at your life, you have never been only good soil. That your whole life you were only good soil. I would argue that's not the case. It might be. I would argue that there have been times in your life where you have been the path. You have not wanted to hear the word of God at all whatsoever. I know, I know that that is true for myself. I know that is true for others in this room. You don't want to hear it. I don't want anything to do with God's word. I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. That book's 2,000 years old. It has no bearing on my life. I don't want to hear anything from it. Maybe. Maybe that you. I would also argue that some of you are the rocky ground at some point in your life. That, that you, you recognize and you're excited about God's word, but 
Man, you just don't have any depth to your faith. You haven't built a foundation yet, and, and every time you try to dig a little deeper, something else comes up in your life that pulls you away, that stops you. Maybe it's the thorns. And going out with friends on a Friday night or a Saturday night is more important than being up here on Sunday morning. That staying up all night and playing video games is more important. That, that reading a book is more important than doing anything is more important than God. I know that I have been, sometimes with even, even within one day, I have been all of these different soil types. Within a day. But you know, there's something that we can do that allows our soil type to become good. When you have some soil in your backyard and you're trying to plant something, and that soil is just not very good, what do you do with it when you want to plant something there? You till it up. You take a shovel. You take, you, you know, whatever you gotta take. Maybe, maybe if it's a big enough backyard, you get some, some actual heavy equipment. But you go and you till that soil up. You remove that which is stopping you, the rocks, the thorns, the briars, the bushes. You add things that will help to make the soil be better. You add nutrients. And then you plant. Your heart may not be good soil today, but it can be if you are willing to till it, if you are willing to break it so that you might be able to hear and receive God's word. Any thoughts, comments, questions, concerns? All right. Verses 21 through 25. And he said to them, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest. Nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. All right. Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed? What do you guys think? Where's your lamp at? Is it up on your nightstand where you can turn it on in the morning and you can see and you know what's going on, you know where you're going? How many of you are afraid of the dark? I don't like the dark. We have a lampstand, we have a lamp, we have a light so that it can show us the way so that we are not in darkness. Because in darkness, there are hidden things, aren't there? When you're a child, you're afraid of the dark. Why? Because there's a monster under the bed. Because there's a monster in that closet. Because mom and dad, if you leave, there's nobody there to protect me. Because we can't see it. And we fear that which we can't see. We fear that which we don't know. And so the light then provides visibility. It, it allows us to see that which is dark so that we don't have to be afraid of that anymore. But we have a, a vision that we can, we can recognize, oh, that monster is not a monster. That's a hat hanging on my door. I don't have to be scared of that. I know what it is. Brethren, we are the lamps in the world. This world is full of darkness. 
We simply need to turn on the news to see that that is the case. Sometimes we don't even need to see that, do we? This world is full of darkness. In so many different varieties and ways and shapes and forms, this world is fallen. But Jesus has picked us back up and set us on our feet so that we might take our light, that which is Jesus. Because if we think our light is us, we're mistaken. The light that shines within us, that is the Christ. That is Jesus. I don't take Chris Carrillo into the world in the hopes of saving people. I take Jesus Christ into the world in the hopes of saving people. Jesus is the light. He is the way. He is the truth. So I don't hide my lampstand. I hold it up proudly, and I hold it up bravely, and I hold it up boldly so that others might see and come to the light. And I shine that light in the darkness to expose it so that that which is sinful, so that that which is lost might be found and might repent. Jesus is the light. He says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And then he says, pay attention to what you hear. <laughs> He's telling these people twice, listen up. I'm going to say something. You need to listen. You need to pay attention. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. For the one who has, more will be given the one who has not even what he has will be taken away. Uh, there is a, um, a, a book that I have been listening to on Audible recently, and it talks about, uh, this is going to sound a little odd, so you're going to have to bear with me for just a minute, but it talks about lobsters. The lobsters in the sea have a very specific hierarchical, uh, I, I guess, way of living. The strong lobsters, the male strong lobsters, uh, will, will fight and they will defend their location and their place. And those who lose fights, the lobster who loses fights, his brain actually changes, and he becomes less dominant and much more subservient. And so a lobster who once had a lot and fights and, and loses will lose everything that he has. And, and, and the females on the same side, they're vying for the, the best mate. They want the best mate. And the ones who are not as attractive or as big or as strong or whatever the case may be, they, they get the lower mates. And one of the things that was said regarding Jesus and regarding this particular topic, because this actually in, in the world, it has been labeled as a principle, the Pareto principle, that those who have will have more of and those who have not will have less of. Why we see in, in, in our society, the, the 1% is, is a real thing, and the rest of the 99 are another. In Jesus' response here, one who has, more will be given. The one who has not, even what he has, will be taken away. The phrase in this book was, you know that Jesus Christ is God. Because his dictum, the things he says, apply even to lobsters, apply even to crustaceans. It applies to everything across all time. Brethren, we as Christians have been given salvation. We have been given hope. Hope of eternal life. That's a promise. That's a knowledge. That's not a, well, I wish it would happen. It's a knowledge of eternal life. And we will be given more. Because when we pass from this life and, and, and when Jesus comes back and we are taken up into heaven to live with him, that promise will be fulfilled. What we have already is insurmountable. It is so much. And we will be given more. Those who have not, even those who think that they have everything because they are wealthy and they, they have their house on a hill, even those who have not 
what they do have will be taken from them. The rich who have not Christ, all their riches will be taken. The most important thing that we can have in this life is Jesus Christ. There is nothing more important, there is nothing greater than having the Son of God to be our Savior. And he said in verse 26, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, and then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe at once, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. I'm going to make a very small point with this. You know, we... We, we, to a degree, understand the processes of life. We understand how certain things work. We understand uh, that when we put a seed in the ground, it will eventually sprout. The seed will break open. Something will come up out of it. And, and then it will continue to grow up through the ground until it has uh, reached outside of the ground. And, and it will get sunlight. It will get water. It will get all of these things that will help it to continue to grow. Right? right. We understand that. What we don't understand is how that happens. How does one little seed turn into that? We don't, we don't see it happen, but it does. God provides that growth. Brethren, we may not always understand what's happening in our life. We may not always be aware of, of what's going on around us or the reason or the rationale or any of that, but we have to believe, we have to understand that God does. God is in control. He has been in control since time was created. And we know that he was in control since time was created because who created time? God. We don't have to know all things. We need to believe and trust in the Lord. Verses 30 through 34. He said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his disciples, his own disciples. He explained everything. A mustard seed is not the smallest seed in the world, but it is the smallest seed that will be sown, and especially in Jerusalem. Uh, in Jerusalem, there, there are lots of different seeds that you can find. But ones that you sow, ones that you intentionally plant in order to receive growth, because that is what this is talking about. It is sown on the ground. It is sown in the earth. The mustard seed is the smallest of those. And this, this seed, as we just talked about, we don't know how it grows, but we understand the process by which it grows becomes a, a tree where birds can, can rest on the branches of it. And he says, this is like the kingdom of God. This is what the kingdom of God is like. If you were to think about the kingdom of God, you can think about a mustard seed. That it starts small. But as it grows, it becomes so large and so full and so wonderful that anything can nestle within it. It will, it will protect the birds. It will keep them from shade. The kingdom of God is wonderful and magnificent. And it will grow. And all of these things are related. They are all related. You've got the parable of the sower. You've got a seed. You've got the mustard seed. These parables, they, they're, they're, they're related to one another. These mustard seeds are not going to grow unless they are sown in good soil. And they're not going to grow without 
God because there is life in those seeds. If you hold a sunflower seed, you recognize there is life in it, waiting to sprout, waiting, waiting to, to grow. God provided that. The last little bit, I know we're, we're moving through these quickly. Uh, I, I do apologize for that, but we are uh, over a chapter behind now. Uh, verse 35, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. Uh, we're going to summarize this real quick. Jesus is tired. And they are crossing the sea. And as they're crossing, there's, there's, a, there's a major storm. And this storm is, is rocking the boat so much so that these trained fishermen, these men who have lived on the sea, who have been in storms, who know what it is like, are terrified for their life. Terrified for their life. And so they wake Jesus up. They fail to recognize what he has already done, the miracles he has already performed, that they are safe with Jesus. In their moment of fear, in their moment of panic, they wake him up, and what does he do? What does he do? He awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace be still. And then he asked them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? This week, let's contemplate our faith in Jesus. Contemplate whether we are still afraid of things we ought not be afraid of. Thank you for your time.